Haramai, Haramai, Pikimai. Welcome to you all on this last of our two hour Papa webinars for 2020. And a very special welcome to those who are joining us for the first time and to those from beyond the Anglican frontier. It's great to know that you're out there and great to know that you're here with us too. A special welcome also to anyone who's watching the delayed coverage. Uh, I hope that you have gathered with people and you find this continues to be a, a meaningful and useful resource for you and your community as you plan your future together. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Jay Ruka, but first a couple of very exciting housekeeping matters. Uh, please remember that if you've missed any of the Foundation's webinars, or if you are looking for the recordings and related resources, just please take a look at the website, wtanglican.nz. Everything is there already. Uh, also, I've had a few requests for the diocesan vision images that you saw shared in the State of the Diocese presentation and again during Bishop Phillips first of the two our Papa sessions as well. Um, you can go online and thanks to the amazing My Lander, we now have her beautiful imagery available. Just go to the website, look for the Anglican drop down and I've disguised it cunningly under the heading vision. At the very bottom of that page are all the pictures you can download and print out to your friends and family. And as always, if you have any clever ideas about what's missing or what might be useful for the website, do let me know and I'll get onto it as quick as I can. So for the past three weeks, we have been acknowledging our alliance on the foundations laid by those who came before us. And further, that the cornerstone of those foundations is Jesus Christ. Clearly, if we don't know what our foundations are, we can't build on them properly. And I have lived in enough dodgy houses to have stopped assuming anything about foundations. And if you've done any renos, you'll know that whatever plans you make can change the moment you get underway. Very soon, you reveal the cracks that were plastered over or the rotten deck that the lounge extension was built on. Uh, these discoveries enable us to face our reality, to accommodate and remediate. They tell us what's possible and so inform the shape of what's next. And that's because the better we understand our foundations, the better our construction can be. So let's take a quick look at what we've tried to do over the past few weeks. In the first instance, this series of webinars has been an open invitation. We've deliberately invited leadership teams from across the diocese together so that we can all be on the same page. Even although our local ministry will be contextual, our Anglican DNA insists that we are part of the one body and we want all the complementary parts to know they have a contribution to make. So we hope that these conversations are helping create momentum in your ministry unit. In week one, Bishop Philip talked about our diocesan vision and values, our call to be grateful to disciple and be discipled, to transform and be transformed. Then Chris Clark spoke about the challenges of transformation, of accepting and leading into change. And last week, Dean Wendy described her experience of doing this. Tonight, we're returning to our foundations and asking what it means to be a New Zealander. As Anglicans, we need to understand what our church is built on in Aotearoa. Constitutionally, we are bicultural and three tikanga. We claim to be treaty partners and we talk about our commitment to peace and reconciliation, to whanaungatanga. But how much of that is evident in what we have constructed? And if we are indeed ready to add another layer, how willing are we to acknowledge the complexity of our foundations and to allow that complexity to inform exactly what happens next? Such questions have not always been easy, let alone welcome in our churches. So tonight is not a lecture. It's an invitation to hear Jay's experience and his challenges. All that he has had to face as someone who is Pākehā, Māori, and deeply committed to Jesus Christ. And we are deeply grateful to you, Jay and Erin, and to your whānau for your willingness to share this critical journey. Um, this exploration along with the Holy Spirit tonight. And so 
as you prepare to tell us that story, may we pray for you. I te atua kaharawa, nau te mana, nau te wehe, nau te ihi. Kororea ki a koe mō tēnei pōnonga a te atua. I te maramataki i te pō. Guide your servant, Jay, as he leads us on the journey you set before him. Make us willing to listen. Open our eyes and ears to the good news that drives us all. Enable us to explore our foundations with integrity. Help us build that which honours you. Amen. So kia ora Jay and welcome again. And in a moment we'll spotlight you. Make sure you're unmuted and ready to go. Awakataka te hau ki te uru, awakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina ki nā ki uta, ki a mā tarutara ki tai, i hi a ki ana te atakura, i te o, i hoka, e hau hū, te hei mauri ora. E nā mana, e nā reo, te nā rā koutou katoa, te nō hari ko a hau ki te kōrero i tēnei pō, ki a koutou. Eho ma, it is a privilege to be here tonight and thank you Stephen for uh, your introduction. Um, my name is, uh, is Jay, uh, as, as you know, uh, and uh, I am uh, going to share a few thoughts uh, with you all tonight. But uh, before I do, I just want to, um, before I share my screen and go through some presentations, uh, I, I, I just want you, to, I want you to relax. Um, thank you for participating in the previous three weeks. Uh, but tonight, I, I really want to tell, uh, through what I want to say, I, I, I want to share my story, some of my story, really. I realize that um, uh, most of you do not know me, uh, nor, nor, nor I you. Uh, and therefore, it is a privilege that I have been asked to be able to present uh, to you tonight, along the topics of our the topic of our um, biocultural journey as a nation, um, I I figured instead of you know sharing a big sort of teaching or whatever that is, um, I think the best way would be to really tell you some of my my journey and some of my story. Um, uh, uh, it's a <laughs> Even to myself, when I think about it, it's a fascinating journey. But uh, I'll leave that up to you to decide. So um, let me uh, kick into here by sharing my screen here um, and play here. So, Tera Ate Maunga Taranaki, He Uriau no Taranaki Maunga, Ko Toko Maru Toko Waka, Ko Teatiawa. Toku iwi, uh, ko Pokitapu, uh, Toku Hapu, ko uh, Muru Raupatu, uh, ko Owai, uh, Oku Marai, uh, ko Waiangana uh, Toku Awa, uh, ko, um, ko Aaron, uh, Aaron uh, Ruka, uh, Toku Hoa Rangatira, uh, ko Ezra, uh, Ratau, ko Indi, ko Raya Aku Tamariki. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Jay. Uh, I fuck a papa to that maunga there, and that uh, that this photo is taken from the top of Karioi Mountain, where I currently live in uh, in the Waikato. Um, and the little karakia I opened with at the start is a karakia that comes from the harbour here in Whangaroa. Um, which is why I began with that uh, uh, karakia calling for the winds to come and gather us. Um, so um, that is the lovely, uh, the lovely uh, um, mountain to which I am going to, from a mountain to which I reside in um, right now. Now, um, uh, a couple of um, uh, uh, when was it? Last last year I was. Um, I was speaking down in uh, in um, in, uh, in Wellington with um, Justin Bishop uh, Justin Duckworth and uh, Bishop Ellie and the um, Wellington Diocese down there, um, 
uh, uh, Justin and Ali had invited me to come down and speak uh, to their to their leaders gathering. I, 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 I trucked down with my family, and because it was the, uh, because of the school holidays, so I took my family there, and I, and I and I rocked up to this event, and I sort of expected about uh, maybe. 50 or 60 people to be there at this leaders gathering and I showed up and there's like 500 and I lean over to my wife Erin and I go good grief I, I think I might have underprepared for this one and anyway I, I went down there and speak the reason the, the reason I was going down to speak is because um, Justin and Ali had asked me to speak on on sort of New Zealand church history which is what I do so um, I, I, I've been I've been in ministry since I was 19. I'm a pastor's kid. My uh, parents were pastors in the apostolic movement, that sort of thing. Um, but but uh, anyway, I went down there to speak and I was a little bit shocked. I was like, there's so many people there. And anyway, I said to Aaron, I better go and make sure I know what I'm talking about. So I did some prep. I, I, did, my, I, I did my talk about New Zealand history and the treaty and some of these things that, that night. And it was, it was awesome. <laughs> Like it was, like it was stunning, and and I say that because like, I, like I, I know in some things I can be good, but I know I'm not that good. In other words, the the presence of God was um, was clearly and evidently there that night, uh, last October um, down in in Wellington. So much so that uh, I I I I actually I actually froze. I was a bit stunned. And um, the, the, um, now, a, a little bit of prehistory here is that probably for the last seven years before this, on numerous occasions, probably in about five different occasions, uh, different different bishops from around the country had tried to recruit me, <laughs> had tried to say, "Hey, Jay, why, why don't you come and work work with us?" And I had resolutely gone, "Nah, bro." Nah, bro. Uh, just, just, just not interested at at all. And anyway, um, after that night where I spoke, um, I was arrested. And one of the reasons I was arrested is because, you know, for the last um, pretty much since two thousand and eleven, since I've been sh really publicly talking about um, New Zealand church history stuff. You know, I know. I, you know, I go around and I try and convince churches of all all types of denominations about our collective history in this country. However, that night um, last October in Wellington, as I was speaking to the Wellington Diocese uh, leaders and and families, I was really really hit by the fact that oh my goodness, this is this is their history, and to 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 varying degrees, they, they they knew that. I went home that night and I said uh, to the Lord, I said, "Okay, God, I, I'm going to open my ears. <laughs> I can open my ears now." You know, you know. I just thought I'd open my ears and um, say, "Okay, God, I, I'll, I'll now listen. If there's something that you want to have for me uh, in this uh, in the Hahi Mihinari, if you, in the Anglican Church, then." K2 point, K a queer. If that is good, I'll leave it with you, and I will. I will, I will never get to listen. And anyway, um, two days. I spoke that night, the night before, and the night after. Sorry. And then the next morning, as I was gathering to leave, um, uh, Bishop Justin comes in and, and he goes, "Now, Jay. Now, I know I've tried to recruit you in the past, blah blah blah, but this is not an offer for me." Um, um, Archbishop Philip. Uh, is looking for someone in Taranaki, would you be interested in a conversation? Now, as soon as he said Taranaki, that beautiful manga there, look at it, eh? Pretty gorgeous. As soon as he said Taranaki, I was like, bro, I'd be interested in that conversation. Um, <laughs> kind of long story sh short, uh, I, I can't remember if it was that following week or a week later, my wife Erin and I um, sat down and had the first conversation with Archbishop Philip and it was one of those things where Aaron and I were kind of like, man, I don't even know if we have to pray about this. This is so sort of obvious. Like the signs were so obvious that we were supposed to be a part of this. And so um, within a few weeks, my wife and I had made up our minds that we were feeling the call of the Lord uh, to join you followers yeah, to join um, the Anglican church in Ahahi Mihinari. So, 
for the past wee while, I've been telling all my um, Pentecostal charismatic mates, um, oh, sorry, and I'll go back to the, that, uh, <laughs> that I'm joining the dark side, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that uh, I'm coming over to, um, to uh, the dark side of the faith with all these people that have all sorts of you know, smells and bells and all that sort of stuff. So that's part of the joke. But um, it is a privilege to be taking up the role of um, the Manu Hotu, uh, one of the, the driving birds, the co-leader of Mere Tapu, of the Taranaki Cathedral. Uh, it's a privilege to join um, with Jackie Patterson um, down there and together as uh, both of us begin to, to shape... Um, uh, a, a, a new season in the life of, of Mere Tapu. It's a privilege to be uh, trusted um, by um, Archbishop Philip, uh, by Jackie, but also by the wider community uh, down there at St. Mary's. Um, you know, I generally have an, an okay radar. And I remember the first time I went down there to the parish and you know, I would go down and go, mm, okay, how, what's this going to be? And it was nothing but absolute warmth and absolute welcome. Um, so I feel absolute privilege um, to, to join the dark side, <laughs> to join Hahi Mihinari and together uh, walk into the future by looking backwards at our history. But just so you know, even though I joke about these things, I do have credentials. <laughs> and at the age of three and a half, uh, the 4th of February, 1979, I was baptized into uh, uh, the Anglican Church, um, uh, the St. Mary's down, down in Ash, little old ashes. Now, one of the cool things I like about this photograph is uh, the date to which I was baptized, and that's the fourth of February. Now that's 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 meaningful to me because when I go back in history, the fourth of February was the night that Henry Williams translated the Treaty of Waitangi. So when my mum sent me this certificate um, uh, fairly recently, all these things had signs on it that I knew the good Lord was speaking and the good Lord was leading me. Now, the reason I was baptized in that church is because my mum and dad uh, met Jesus in that church. And I want to show you, here's a, here's a photo of my dad. This is um, Clement John Lucas, or, or you might want to call him Uncle Buster. Now, he is not a priest. Uh, he is, he, he, in this photo, he is acting as a priest in an Air New Zealand commercial. <laughs> yes, he was in an Air New Zealand commercial once acting as a minister. Now, um, the reason I put up this photo is because dad was, when dad met Jesus and when he joined the church down there, dad was asked to, to become an Anglican minister, actually. And, uh, and so he contemplated it. And then when they found out, uh, whoever it was, found out that dad couldn't speak to the old Māori and he didn't know much about his his culture and his background, um, the sort of the, the, the water turned cold. And so the pathway didn't open up for him down there. Now, um, the Māori word for a leader in, um, in the Māori language is rangatira. Now, rangatira, ranga means to weave, tira is a line or a row. So that row is the row of your ancestors. In other words, a rangatira is someone who weaves the, the thread who weaves the, the, the line of their tupuna, of their ancestors. Um, I am convinced that in this opportunity that I've been given before me, that I am standing in the line of what God has called me and particularly called my family and called my father and my mother to something, that I am wonderfully um, getting the opportunity to fulfill this. Now, Many of you know, and as um, Stephen um, has told you about, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, I wrote a book. And uh, um, here's me giving the first copy of the book to my mum and dad uh, at, <clears throat> at Owai Marae, um, 
at, our, at our marae down there in Taranaki at an event that we were running down there. Um, so um, uh, one of the reasons I put this photo up is because um, my mum and dad, they, this is a move of the spirit. And that is they shifted to Taranaki about six weeks ago. So they are the first in our immediate whānau within the Roka Lucas family to return back to Taranaki since the 1820s, since the heke down to Wellington and Waikawa Picton and then across to Motueka and eventually uh, out down to Westport in the South Island where I grew up. Um, so um, it's a pretty privilege um, for me to know that the mahi that uh, I'm engaged in with you has a strong sense of historical calling that is really immediate and effective in my own family's life. So even though I don't necessarily know most of you face to face, I feel very strongly that God has brought my family in to be able to work uh, together with you. And in particular, in the Waikato Taranaki Diocese, as we um, begin to shape what it might look like as we move ahead in our time. This image here is um, one of the glories of Germany. <laughs> now, the reason I put this up is, in the past, this is how I've described myself as a kinder surprise. I'm uh, white chocolate on the inside, brown chocolate on the outside. In other words, on the outside, I look like I'm Māori, but on the inside, really, I'm just good old a monkey bar kid. In other words, I don't really know much about te ao Māori. My father, who was one of 13, was not raised at all with a Māori mind, with Māori thinking. His father at the time said, no, um, we're not going to um, raise our kids with anything to do in the Māori world. Um, my, uh, my grandmother, she could call it all Māori, but my grandfather wouldn't let him, uh, wouldn't let her speak it. So hence my father and uh, many of his siblings, not all, um, has not been raised at all uh, in, a, in a te ao Māori world or in a te ao Māori mindset. So these are some of the, um, these are some of the struggles that I have um, faced with in my time and in my journey um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a young Māori man. So just letting you know is that everything that I'm talking to you about tonight, I'm not, necessar I'm not necessarily coming to you from, uh, oh, well, I don't consider myself an expert, but I consider myself uh, a person passionate about the journey of God in my country. Uh, and as I've pursued God and the heart of God for my land and my, uh, my country, God has a, a, awoken within me the significance of who I culturally am uh, as a person. Now, let me tell you about a little gathering I used to run. My wife and I used to run. In um, 2006, my wife and I started to run some summer gatherings for young adults. We wanted, to, we wanted to provide a space for people to um, start the year with a bit of focus on the spirit of Jesus and some uh, teaching to, to, to help people engage with their study as they head out, headed out into, the, into academic study or into the workplace uh, at the beginning of, of, of a year. We sort of focused around church history learning about John Wesley, George Whitfield, you know, uh, William and Catherine Booth, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, oh, different characters of church history. Um, in 2008, when it came to the third time we ran this gathering, um, the good Lord whispered into my ear and he said, Jay, this time I want you to study New Zealand church history. And I was like, man, New Zealand church history? I don't know anything about New Zealand church history. And I was like, I, I paused for a moment and I thought to myself, how can I grow up in a country my whole life? How can I grow up in a, in a church institution that claims to 
say some pretty that that has some pretty big claims about our country and the world and all this sort of thing. How can I how can I be a part of this and not know anything about our Christian story? And I was like, that's that's fascinating. And so in the summer of two thousand and eight. Um, I hosted this gathering and had a couple of people come and speak, and they unpacked some of the incredible stories um, of of church history and the way that uh, Maori responded to the gospel, particularly around from the, particularly between the t- period of 1835 and 1845. Hands down, a, 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 an unprecedented move of God. Missionary George Clark wrote in his journal in 1845. That forty, an estimation of four, uh, no, sixty-four thousand Maori attending church on a Sunday. He estimated three thousand Maori in catechism at that time, uh, and that's out an estimated population of, um, I think it was about ninety to one hundred and twenty thousand at that time. So you do the math; the majority of Maori were going to church on a Sunday around the eighteen forty-five period. Hands down, our people were impacted and influenced by the gospel and the stories of Jesus. Um, and when I learned the story, I was like, man, how, why do I not know this? How, how can I grow up in a church institution my entire life and not know anything about the story? And it sort of led me to go, one, I was absolutely amazed. And at the same time, a little bit, a little bit brassed off that nobody, A, told me and B, even knew it, knew, knew about it. So that same week we were, um, the same week, we were running this gathering and learning these stories for the first time. My wife had a dream and in her dream, this is what she saw. She, she saw a, a very large chicken, a chicken so big, three stories tall. It was so big that she, in her dream, she even laughed and she was like, Oh my goodness, that's a big chicken. And then, and, and then uh, the, it, was, it was standing in front of a pahuta kawa tree. And then she heard the word huia and woke up. Now that um, when I, it was an afternoon nap um, that she had, because she was pregnant with our second child. And then afterwards, when I saw her, she, she said to me, Jay, look, I just, I just had this dream. I saw this massive chicken, and then I heard the word huia. And her question to me is, what is huia? What's a huia? She thought I might have had something to do with a hui, because she knew what a hui was. Because Erin, my wife, is from America. She's from the United States. And so she didn't know what, what even huia was. So I was able to say to her, look, look, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bird that's indigenous to New Zealand. Um, and so, look, we, we prayed into this dream. We sat on it for a year and spoke, um, spoke it to three people over the course of a year. It was so vivid. And even when she shared it, to me, it was so vivid that I was like, man, what is this dream about? Cut a long story short. Um, I don't know if you know this, but chickens aren't from New Zealand. <laughs> chickens aren't from here uh, chickens are birds that have been imported from another space and another time and have come into this country uh, and what this dream um, wh- one of the things that what this dream meant to us is that the chicken represented ways of being and ways of thinking that had come from somewhere overseas and had planted themselves here but had now growing unusually oversized and dominating the landscape. Whereas the huia, on the other hand, was a bird that was unique to New Zealand, a bird that was indigenous to New Zealand, a bird that was so sacred to Māori that its feather was given to chiefs or leaders of distinction for their community. It was the highest emblem that within tribes you could give someone was a huia feather that they could wear in their, in their heads. The huia within our Ma- within Māori cosmology was one of the sacred gatekeepers of the highest realms where Iō Matua Kōri dwelt. Um, the huia bird, uh, it had uh, the the female had a long curved beak where the male had a short stubbier one, and these birds um, mated and lived in pairs uh, and mated for their for their um, entire life. But these, uh, these birds were incredibly friendly, actually. They were actually known to hop up and sit on trampers' boots in the bush, believe it or not. Um, but we no longer have the huia. We've lost it. Now, um, after after Aaron had this dream, we began to contemplate it. We began to see images and artwork of uh, huia everywhere. Was it the placebo effect? Well, some might say yes, but I say no. <laughs> we began to see this. Um, 
we began to see people doing art everywhere. Uh, a friend of mine heard me speak and she painted this picture and she said, well, if the Huia did come home, what would the, well, if the Huia was to come back, um, what, would, what, what would we find? And she drew a picture of the Huia flying over <laughs> the gorse bush. Um, about six weeks after I spoke some of this message uh, about the Huia in Palmerston North, this was erected in the Palmerston North Square, not because of my message, but because something was in the air. Something was happening. Uh, in, um, uh, in 2010, one Huia feather sold for 8,400 New Zealand dollars. It is the most expensive feather uh, ever sold in the history of the globe. Um, from this, from this dream and from this phase, uh, Aaron and I coined this phrase called Huya Come Home. In other words, we need to be living and we're dwelling at a time where if God has said the word Huya, then what that means to us is that God is saying to us, hey, I know what, what we understand to be modern New Zealand, a lot of it has been built off the back of ideas, of cultures, of ways of thinking, of ways of organizing, of ways of structuring that have come to us from some other space and imported, imported here. But there are indigenous ways of doing things. There are indigenous ways of living, indigenous ways of leading, indigenous ways of structuring, ways of being that are unique to this landscape, that for by and large, most of New, New Zealand doesn't really see or hear or feel or understand. And therefore, we're living in this era, in this season where I think God is saying to us, Huya, come home. In other words, will New Zealand begin to look at those things that are unique to this landscape and this landscape alone? Now, I know Hahi Mihanari, I, I, I know have done a lot of work for a long, long time over this. But when it comes to the wider body of Christ around this country, most of our resources are not from here. Most of the songs we sing are not from here. Most of the discipleship resource and materials we use in our churches are not from here. Now, I'm grateful. I'm looking around for my prayer book. Why can't I see it? It's normally on my desk. Oh, it's over there. Um, I, I'm grateful that our prayer, our prayer book has beautiful karakia and prayers and services and ways of doing that from here. It's a beautiful thing. But by and large, when you look at the body of Christ, a lot of what we do and how we do it doesn't come from Aotearoa New Zealand. Now, you multiply that on a society scale. You multiply that on governing and politics. You multi multiply that on educational theory. Um, a lot of what we do and what we are, you multiply it on economics. Um, a lot of what we are and what we've become has come because of other ways of being and thinking that aren't unique to this landscape in this place. Now, I think you, as much as the COVID scenario is not cool at all, I think there's also a thing that God is saying, hey, come home, because you literally can't go to the globe right now because stuff's going on and stuff's happening, right? Um, When I began to learn this stuff, and I began to learn what God was doing, and to see the incredible movement and the incredible leaders, um, both both some of the early missionaries like um, Mary Ann and Henry Henry Williams, you know, like Robert Maunsell, well, he did have a little slight period though, like um, uh, Octavius Hadfield, you know, some of these people who are who are who who, who are my missional European, uh, European heroes who gave up their lands to come and serve my people. Um, when I think of um, Wurumu Tamihana, Rangatira from Ngāti Haua, I think one of the greatest Christian leaders our country has ever had, who could memorise books of the Bible, 
who, when you read his speeches to Parliament, quoted scripture after scripture to the government of the day, saying, why won't you uphold the scriptures? Why is you who have brought us the gospel, why won't you uphold the scriptures in the way that you rule and govern? People like Wurimu Tamihana were absolutely amazing, absolutely powerful. You know, need we mention the, the, the prophets, Tohu uh, Hantawiti from Pariaka, amazing, amazing men who could read the scriptures and, 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 and begin to communicate the wider from these. So when I look at all these incredible histories, I go, man, you know, what, 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 went, what went wrong? While I don't have the time to unpack the history and the story of the treaty right now, um, I just want to show you some maps. When, when, po post the treaty and post when the treaty was signed, you know, our, our chiefs and our leaders signed a document saying that we could retain our land. But I don't know if you've seen these images and these maps from the New Zealand Online Encyclopedia. But these maps represent the, the, the um, land that was in Māori ownership. So if we start at the top left, that's a map from 1860, the dark. So the dark represents Māori uh, land holdings. So 20 years after the signing of the treaty, it said that our leaders and our people could retain their land. That's what's left. We go down to 1890, 50 years. You go down across to 1910 on the top right, then the bottom right is 1939, uh, 100 years after the signing of a document that said that our people could retain onto the land as, as long or as much as we wanted, wanted it. Um, when I look at the South Island in 1860, I see that the entire South Island was broken into blocks uh, and sold and gone from the ownership of our people. So not a cool scenario at all. Currently, um, I believe Māori uh, uh, land ownership is at about, is at about 6.4% of the country. Um, so the story of Christianity is deeply related to the story of land in this country. It's deeply related to the way that we think about the land, the way to which we act upon the land. Now, a couple of things I want to show you here. Oh, before I do that, do, do we need to take a break? Do we want to take a little, maybe a two minute pause? All right, good looking people. Not that I can see you, but let's, uh, let's get going here. Um, everybody say after me, 1907. Awesome, right. Just a date um, I want to I want to pick out here, and just just to, just to highlight a couple of things. In 1907, the Tohunga Suppression Act came in. Uh, the Tohunga Suppression Act, um, which um, which banned the right of Tohunga Maori um, ex experts, particularly particularly in the realm of spiritual matters and um, and healing and all this sort of thing were publicly banned uh, from uh, uh, by, by the government. Um, two reasons they brought it in, because they weren't happy with um, what Rua Kienana was doing um, over at Maunga Puhatu, um, who, by the way, this year was um, pardoned. Th thank the good Lord for that. Um, but also because of the Spanish flu ep epidemic that was sweeping through the country at the time as well. And... Um, which is interesting because of the environment we find ourselves in today, the, um, the, 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 the influenza that swept at that time had a, had a massive effect on our people. So in 1907, but the government actually made a law that was banning the right of our tohonga to actually operate on a, on, a, on a way that we had done since from from long time ago. Now, luckily that was lifted in 1954. Um, in 1907, uh, the same year, 
the prophets of Parihaka, uh, Do'u and Tewiti, they both passed away the same year of 1907. Now, let me just read you this quote here. Uh, it is in, oh, you know what, I can't read it because my screen's blocking some of the words. Uh, my, my, uh, oh man, no, I can't read Can it. I read it for you, Jay? Yeah, you read it out, Steve, go bro. It is inconceivable that an Indian child growing up today would not know about Gandhi. Just as it is impossible to imagine a child in the United States not knowing about Martin Luther King Jr. or a South African child, Nelson Mandela. Yet generations of New Zealand children have grown up in ignorance of a man whose message and practice of peace and nonviolent protest preceded theirs by decades. Bro, you should get into audiobook reading. What a great narration right there. Um, Tohu and Tewiti, the prophets of Parihaka. Now, I know there's been a resurgence over the last few years, but most New Zealanders grow up not knowing anything about the story. And these two prophets passed away in the same year the Tohunga Suppression Act came in in 1907. Now, let me backtrack by six years. In 1901, the Duke and Duchess of York came out to, to, to New Zealand to visit the colony. Uh, as um, good royals should, right? Now, this is classic. Now, these guys came came here. They were in Rotorua. Now, because the Duke is a chief, right? Uh, he is he is a leader. Uh, when he was in um, Rotorua with Te Arawa, a kuia from, um, from the iwi gave um, the Duke of York a huia feather. And he put that huia feather in his bowl. She put the huia feather in his bowler hat and then journalists took photos of uh, of 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 um, the Duke of York with a huia feather in his in his um, in his bowl hat. Now those images went all around the world, and all of a sudden, people all around the globe uh, saw those images of this lovely sacred feather that people all around the world wanted a huia feather. So from 1901, the huia was hunted like crazy and unfortunately hunted to extinction, all for the sake of a fashion statement. So we lost the huia because of international media and international fashion desire. Something that was so sacred to the Māori world, something that was so unique to the specific space called Aotearoa New Zealand, and in all of God's green earth, the only place he put the huia was here in New Zealand, and we lost this bird. Uh, the last time it was seen was on December 28, 1907, and the huia was hunted uh, to extinction because of fashion. That's right. Now, 1907 was the last time we saw this bird. 1907 was the last year it was removed from our sight. It was the moment that nobody saw the bird again. But I believe with all of my heart that God, who's caused things that are not as though they were, is calling the spirit of the huia, at least, back to life. Now, I know those birds are with God, are with Jesus right now in heaven. I know beyond the veil they exist. But right now, um, God is asking and is calling for something on this side uh, for New Zealand to learn about this bird. Let me, uh, uh, let me show you a little law here from 1861. This is the first conservation law in New Zealand. Uh, and the first conservation law in New Zealand was to encourage the importation of foreign species. If you go down to the bottom, no deer of any kind, hare, swan, partridge, English plover, rook, starling, thrush, or blackbird, blackbird shall be hunted. So check this out. The first conservation law in New Zealand protected introduced species. Why? 
because the belief at the time was that anything from overseas, anything from England, anything from Europe, uh, whether that be plant or animal or person or way of doing things, was far superior than anything to be found here in New Zealand. It was just it's just the mindset. Now it's very easy for me, and it's very easy for us to look back again. <laughs> right, I want a bunch of muppets. But the thing about learning about the history is, like, man, look, people were just doing what they did. They people were just doing what they believed was right. But the point in looking and and digging up, and the point of learning history is to go, oh my goodness, what were they thinking? Therefore, what am I thinking right now? Like, what, what am I believing right now? What am I doing right now? What am I practicing right now? That might be in 50, 60, 100 years time, but like, there might be little, you know, little, little great, 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 great grandchildren, you know, calling us out and going, remember that fella, Jay, what, a, what an egg. Like, I, I don't know. But the pur purpose of learning from history and learning from our story is not to go look how dumb those fellas were, it's to go, man, what am I doing right now that is not helpful? What, what, what's the blind spots that I've got in my life and in my work that, one, aren't really helping society, but, but two, importantly, are not what God is actually asking me to do? What am I doing in my life right now that I might be blind to that is not perhaps God is wanting to show a different way or a new way? Um, this is why we learn about history. Now, I'm kind of jumping all around here, so sorry if this is not translating over in, that, that, in, in the wide internet, interweb world. But um, let me go to this fella, um, Bishop Selwyn. When, uh, when, when the government began to take uh, Māori land, people like Henry Williams and Mary Ann and William Williams and Octavius Hadfield, these guys were saying, man, this is not right. This is like completely crazy. Um, We've got to stop this. Now, George Selwyn, I don't know what, it, you know, for whatever his reason was, he wrote back to William Williams and he, this is what he said. He said, we shall be united and we shall support the government with all of our might. Now, this, in the 1840s, was the official position of the church, was to support the crown that was beginning to take all of that land. Now, I don't know about you, but that, kind of, that's, that pretty much sucks, right? That's, that's, I'm, I'm sure he's a great guy if he sat down and had tea and scones with, scones with him, right? But he had ideas that were thinking that actually weren't of the spirit of God that weren't listening to the spirit, even within the missionaries, let alone Māori, let alone the people, that wasn't tika or pono or, or aroha, that wasn't right, that wasn't truthful, that wasn't loving. Um, and and, and, and the, um, when the land wars broke out in Waitara um, and uh, Tainui and Maniapoto were discussing uh, whether they should come down and support um, Te Atiawa down there, um, um, one guy stood up, um, I think it was in Kihiki actually, and, he, and this is what he said, he says, when the missionaries came first, they had two plows, one for heaven and one for earth. The one for heaven was kept going before our eyes, the other kept out of sight. Now, I love this. This is in the 1860s, right? And right here, this guy is speaking to philosophical dualism without even knowing those words. In other words, within his Māori worldview, he knew that something wasn't right, where the gospel could talk about heaven, 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 yet on the ground, our lives our, and our livelihood be ripped out from us. And he knew that something was wrong. And this is why um, our, our people drove and left um, the church. And I don't want to say they left Jesus, they left the church in a massive way, in a, in, in a, in a, just in a, in a quick way is what people came in in those late 1830 periods. From the 1850s onward, the exit was just as fast. Now, I'm in a precarious position because good old Archbishop has invited me to, into a role to be a co-leader of a church that this fellow started. Sometimes I ask myself, what am I doing? 
why would I even want to do this? Uh, for those of you who haven't been to, to Mere Tapu, um, you know, this is one of the graveyard, gravestones out in the front there. You know, um, dear old Mr. Hugh Harris, you know, uh, only 25 years of, of age, who was cruelly murdered by the rebel Maoris at uh, Waitera on the 28th of July, 1860. You know, as a Māori, I'm the now leader of a place that hosts these beautiful young men uh, who gave their lives in vain. I'm connected to this story, to this history. I'm connected and I'm in the lead, I'm, I'm, I'm a leader where the bannerments of uh, the soldiers that fought my people uh, have been posted on the walls of the cathedral down there. Now, the reason I'm here tonight is not because I'm a smart guy or certain people might like me or what. I'm here because many, many people have gone before me. Um, it's cool that over the last 10 years, people of Meritapu and Tiatiawa and all the other iwi in Taranaki have begun to go on a journey I've really been honest with our history. We've been mindful of our history, of knowing our history, of not saying, oh, I'm just going to leave that. But here's what New Zealanders do. Anything to do with the treaty? Let's just, oh, we just leave it to the government, right? Let's just leave it to the government. Okay, anything to do with Maori issues? Oh, let's just leave those to the bishops. Or let's just leave those to the tikanga, those fellows over there, right? No. No way. That All that sort of stuff and all that sort of thinking has to change because you and I live on the ground. We live on the soil. We live on land that was taken. We live, on, we live in places right now where people are still feeling the effects of all of that stuff. And it's the original mission of the church that the church is called to engage with on a much, much, much greater level again today. And this is an image and a photo of the people who have gone before me and gone before Jackie, uh, who, who are doing stuff and have taken those bannerments and passed them through the hands of the congregation, have passed them through the hands of the iwi and not put them in a dusty old room somewhere to be forgotten, to, but to put them in a certain place at the church where they're not now main seen by everyone, but you can still see them when they leave because when they leave, Everybody has to be reminded of the story. I am here tonight to talk to you because of Tiki Tuturangi Raumati. I am here because of the journey that this man has had with Archbishop Philip. I am here because to say this message, because of what this man has pioneered in the spot of the Cathedral of Taranaki that this man, in spite of the history that he and his whanau knew, that when he passed away a couple of years ago, he wanted to be buried in the cathedral of Meritapu next to those soldiers who people wrote racist things on their gravestones. He wanted to be buried there because he knew that his whanau, his hapu, and his iwi to come and visit him had to come and make peace in the grounds of Meritapu on the puke of uh, Pukaka, the sacred hill where Ngāti Tewhiti once stood. This is what's going on. He knew there had to be a returning. Now, if he knew that, do we know that? This is just one landscape in our diocese. Waikato Taranaki Diocese is so incredibly rich in Wairua Māori, in Tikanga Māori, 
and ways of being, being and thinking in Māori mindsets and Māori leadership. That if, if, if we as a church don't get on the bus, we are going to miss what God is rising, not within the church, but within the Māori world. Are you and I going to be present to serve what is rising in those spaces? Now, let me just close here with some more thoughts about the huia. One of my favorite theologians, Woda Brueggemann, says, what a commission it is. Just thinking of Stephen right now reading this. What a commission it is to express a future that none think imaginable. Of course, this cannot be done by inventing new symbols, symbols that don't originate from here, for that is a wishful thing. Rather, it means to move back into the deepest memories of this community and activate those very symbols that have been known correctly, that have been known concretely in this particular history. Metaphors from England aren't going to cut it in this land. Ways of being and describing from elsewhere. Sure, they're going to... I'm Scottish, right? My mum's a Bruce. So, like, you know, if I hear a bagpipe, something happens in my bones, right? I go, man, that's beautiful. But if you really, really want to resonate to the depths of this country, you and I have to find motifs, metaphors to attach to that language themselves and frame themselves in ways of thinking that are from here. Why? Because I believe this is what God is actually saying. I believe this is what God is crying out. That from this country and from this space would become a way of thinking that is, that is unique and indigenous and special to this landscape. Now, let me close with this slide. I hope by now that everyone has seen this pretty funny movie he's tricky like that that jesus one of my favorite quotes but hunt for the wilder people is a story about an old pakeha man and a young maori wannabe gangster skucks life kid the movie is about their story and they come together and their journey different cultures different worlds on a journey coming together and at the end of the movie, when they finally make peace, the last thing that the movie says that leaves with us and what they're going to do is that here is this old Māori man, here is this young Māori boy, and together they're going back into the bush to find what bird? They're going back in the bush to find the huia. Now, I know this is a story. I know this is a metaphor. But this is what God is saying. This is what God is doing in our land. These storytellers are picking up on those things that are unique to our space and unique to our landscape. I believe with all my heart that God has said over this land the word huia. How can you learn from that which is unique? How can you learn from that which is special? How can you learn from that which is indigenous to this space and this space only? The ground to which we live in. Now, it's not that the chicken's wrong, right? The chicken ain't, the chicken ain't wrong. It's just the chicken shouldn't be three stories tall. But something has happened where just our ways of thinking, our ways of operating, our, our ways of doing things have grown unusually large and oversized and aren't things that speak uniquely to our space. I believe the spirit of the sovereign Lord is truly upon us. I believe there's been something in the heart of the mind of God all along to bring our peoples together. I believe with all my heart in Acts 17 that says it's God who determines the times and the seasons. 
and the boundaries and the exact boundaries where people should live in the hope that they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. It's funny how we've created a theology that he is. But anyway, I believe that it's the mind and the heart of God that he brought Kupe here, that he brought our Tupuna here, that he brought the, uh, my Wakatukumaru here. The last time it came here was in the four, about 1420-ish, somewhere around there. I believe at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, Galatians 4.4. I believe at just the right time, he sent Augusto man stooped in his own cultural worldview called Samuel Marston. But at, the, but at the right time, he came here and gave a message to our people. At the right time, he had sent off Ruatara to learn about the gospel and to pick it up while he was offshore. I believe at just the right time, something happened where our peoples made an agreement around the Tatiriti or Waitangi. They made agreement in the spirit of the gospel in the spirit of reconciliation, in the spirit of togetherness and partnership, and said, hey, we're going to create a new space. We're going to create a new country, a new way of doing things. Now we know what happened. That vision got railroaded. But I believe as followers of Jesus, as men and women who are called to be leaders in the body of Christ in this country, we are called to be leaders in the original vision of the church in this country. And that's because at just the right time, he said, now is the time for Māori to know personally the story of Jesus within their own tribal stories. That's my talk, folks. That's what I have to say. I am looking forward to being on a journey with you and I'm looking forward to maybe to be able to unpack and teach some history and some specifics and some worldview differences as we move into the future and stuff like this. But my goal tonight was to present to you me and the journey that I'm on. I know that God has said these things to me. I believe he's saying them to the country. Sometimes I go, what am I doing joining the Anglican Church? Why am I being a part of something that wears funny clothes that my people don't wear? If you know what I mean. I'm, I'm coming into this role to ask the question, where is the huia? Can the huia find a home here? Can the huia find a home amongst us? I'd like to leave this with you, that you just begin to look at the bird. Google some images of the huia. Look it up and begin to pray this prayer with me. Huia, come home. Ite whānau whānui, tēnā rākoutou, tēnā rākoutou, tēnā rākoutou katoa. Kia ora. Kia ora, Jay. That was uh, quite extraordinary. You can't beat authentic passion, and you've got that in spades, certainly for us tonight. <laughs> uh, in a moment, we're going to do a big thing. I'm going to do a big thank you for what you've shared this evening, and then Bishop Philip will gather us together in prayers uh, for this, our final night of the series. But right now, we've got an opportunity for people to ask any questions that they might have, and I've anticipated the first. I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, if you do have a question, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A box along the bottom of your screen. Just roll your mouse down and that should pop up. Um, also, use the chat box if you've got any reflections. We've seen some brilliant chat tonight. Um, lots of wonderful feedback for Jay. Lots of energy in there, which is awesome. You can also raise a hand if you wanted to ask a live question. But to all those people who have been ringing me on my phone and texting me and chatboxing me, yes, 
you can buy this man's book and you should. Uh, we have hard copies that we can get you access to. There are uh, electronic copies through Kindle. And Jay has even read his book. I should have got you to do it, Brian. Ah, look, <laughs> look, book two's coming up. I'm good to go. <laughs> um, look, I know it's an audio book because I know that some of you are already listening to it. So Jay, you're having an impact. You're getting into our skin, you're getting into our DNA. Uh, and that's what this has been about. So I will stop talking um, and invite people to ask these questions or, or make any comments. Ah, here is a hand up already. Andrew Evans, I'm just going to invite you to talk. Hopefully you can unmute. Hey Jay, Andrew Evans, I'm the vicar of Middle Earth. Um, I'm, I'm a real chicken. Um, <laughs> uh, I uh, come from South Africa and uh, I have less credentials in the Anglican Church than you do. I was baptized <laughs> Methodist. Um, my wife's read your book and I haven't quite got to it yet, but very intrigued by it and their school's working through it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm leading a congregation that is pale face, Pākehā, descendants of chickens, if you like. Um, and, uh, and the relationship here between uh, Pākehā and Māori is pretty much non-existent, right? Um, and, and Anglican work amongst the Māori in my area is also almost non-existent at this stage. Um, so, I mean, what you're saying philosophically is brilliant, um, but I'm just wondering if you have possibly practically one or two things to say, well, you guys want to go on a journey, uh, this would be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, practical one, two, you know, where, where, where do you start? Where do you go? Yeah, kia ora, Andrew. Thanks for your, thanks for your question. Uh, a couple of things I'd say. One is, ed, um, first is education. Um, so um, just be begin to learn about the, the stories to where you live. I mean, learn about some of the church history. Um, uh, I, I, when I when I first when I first heard the story, I was like, you know, what? Why do I not know this? So, I basically for the next three years, I just read. Um, I just read whatever I could put my hand up, and then I went to Wananga. I, I went and listened to people talk who I knew, sort of knew who knew something. So, um, because the narrative. Um, because the narrative is not mainstream, you've got to pursue it. But in saying that, if you do scratch just a little bit, man, there's there's a lot of info that's already out there. Um, I've just seen someone are asking for the name of my book. The book is called Huia Come Home. If you go to huiacomehome.co.nz, there's a resource page, and you can read a whole lot of, lot of stuff there. Some other very good friends of mine run a trust called Karufa. Uh, that's K-A-R-U-W-H-A, -A, Karu Fa, um, which is the name that Māori gave Henry Williams. Karu uh, Fa means four eyes. Henry Williams wore glasses, but that's the name Māori gave him. Pre Billy T. James. Um, they've got a great resource there uh, with a whole bunch of both missionary bios, um, both uh, Māori leader um, biographies and this sort of thing. Um, uh, and another thing... Um, that I, I, another thing I've seen powerful was actually prayer. I, I remember a friend of mine um, who uh, lives in Cambridge and she stumbled across this stuff and she's like, she basically just said, God, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm white on rice. I know absolutely nothing, but I just avail, avail myself to you. And it was something like within the next few days, randomly a local komato had knocked on the door because he was like, sort of selling electricity or something like this. She ended up having a two hour cup of tea with this fella. And, and the doors begin to un, unravel in their, um, in their communities. But I, I, I would say begin to, ed, begin to educate yourself. Just begin to go, God, I know nothing. Open up the ways for me. And then two, and, 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 and I know this might sound strange, but just remember that um, Mata Mata and Tauranga and Taupo don't exist like like they're not real places like be, begin to practice mata mata begin to practice tauranga topo topo nui atia and, and and in other words um 
you know, if people don't have the capacity to enroll in a language course, begin to try and practice saying it, saying the real correctly. They're, all these are little things that you, you, you might not even know. You might, uh, you're in a supermarket and you might not even know you're saying um, mata mata, but an old kuya might hear you and she's going to go, whoa, who's that white fellow saying, who's, who's saying it properly? Honestly, it goes, it actually goes a long, long, long way. So that's a few things off the top of my, off the top of the list there. Jay, we've got a couple of Q&A that have come through as well. The first one is, has anyone made a study guide out of your book that we can use in a parish group study? I feel an opportunity coming on. Uh, my wife has wanted to since day one, but hasn't yet. Um, so no, we haven't. But it's in it's in the mind. It's in the mind. Uh, we do have a couple more minutes. If anyone has a, a question that they would like to ask, uh, I'm just going to quickly look down the list of chat as well. Uh, I will, as Jay said make the link to the website available and that resource page so you know how to access the book. Bishop Phillips indicated that we have some copies at Charlotte uh, Brown House as well uh, and more affirmation for the audio book too. Thanks Leah and Matt. Oh, well, look if there are no further questions uh, or comments at this time, I would like to take the opportunity just to say thank you, Jay. I think one of the wonderful things about when we come together and tell our story is that everyone who's listening is making little connections all the way through. So you say, oh, I was um, baptised in Ash of Vegas, and I'm thinking, whoa, I was baptised in, uh, I was born in Fielding and baptised just across the road in the same year. And you say, oh, and here's Taranaki, that's my manga, and I, I grew up in the shadow of it. And uh, uh, Tehuya was my school bird. Uh, so coming to uh, Waikato to find Bishop's house on Huya Drive and then seeing the bird up on the inside of St. David and St. George, these links that we make as you talk are the way that we begin to weave our stories together. We become you know, closer as one people. So I hope that everyone like me has been making those connections. Uh, tonight, Man, I, like, dude, I found out something today I didn't even know. But the northern boundary of my tr of Te Awa tribe is Te Rau or Te Huia. I actually uh, didn't know that. Uh, we can't get away from it. God is God is speaking to us. Um, it was one of the most arresting moments for me of your discussion tonight. Was you know, what am I doing, thinking, believing, practicing right now? That and five months, five years, 50 years, I'm going to look back on and just think, ah, oh, how embarrassed, how ashamed am I of where my thinking was, how caught up in my giant chicken space um, was I and how do I trick myself down to an appropriate scale? So that's a really powerful thing for us to do. But that power that you're able to convey, you do with so much humour um, that it makes me want to, get involved and take up the challenge and that is a gift and it's part of that legacy of Tiki Tutarangi uh, who was so willing <laughs> through some of the most inappropriate stories and powerful uh, <laughs> kōrero, uh, that many of us have heard to force us into those uncomfortable spaces that you want to take us into as well and that's the place of the church it's the place of those who claim to follow Jesus so um, may we all have the courage to step into that space as well because when we do we'll find you right there at the heart of it um i've got to say kilda to our bishop as well given how hot you were um amongst all the bishops trying to claim you uh, thanks be to god <laughs> uh, that he was able to reel yeah. you in uh, yeah great result uh, so on that, uh, Bishop, could I hand over to you, please, for uh, any final thoughts or reflections you might have and prayers. Kia ora, Jay. Yeah, kia ora, Jay, from, from me too. Um, you took me uh, down some, some pathways I wasn't expecting uh, when you showed the image of 
tiki tutarangi uh, I wept. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I loved the image of Kinder Chocolate, partly because uh, I'm an absolute chocoholic. I cannot uh, stop it once I start. Uh, Easter is not a good time for me, you know, a time of focusing in on the sacrifice of Jesus. And there's all these uh, tempting large chocolate eggs, chicken eggs. Um, but I, I did think um, and wanted to uh, just acknowledge another one of those who, who um, you know, cleared the pathway. Um, Tiki's cousin, uh, Paul Reeves, to And uh, in particular, uh, it's another it's another kind of image around the Kinder egg, but the image that um, Tuiti Orongamai spoke of when he talked about the speckled potato, um, and. Uh, I remember vividly, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, uh, Paul standing me in front of the plaque in Meditapu, which records um, the life of Robert Paris. And Robert Paris was the, the agent of the, of, the, uh, of the government that facilitated the confiscations uh, of Taranaki land. And Robert Paris, uh, just as um, Sir Paul's, the great, great, Great grandson of Tweety Rongamai, direct descendant. Uh, Beverly Reeves, his wife, is the direct descendant, the great, great, great granddaughter of Robert Paris. And uh, so his, their children, um, Judge Sarah Reeves, who's a, uh, a judge of the Māori Land Court and a, 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 um, a jurist for the Waitangi Tribunal. Uh, their daughter uh, Bridget, who's a bit of an entrepreneur, and uh, their daughter Jane, who's a documentary filmmaker, are uh, speckled potatoes. You know, fuck a papa back to uh, Robert Paris on one side and uh, Twitty Rongamai on the other side. Uh, and one of the things that I've appreciated time and time again, uh, uh, Jay, is the way in which um, you speak um, in, a, in, in, a, in an inclusive way. You use we and our, whether you're talking from your, you know, uh, Pākehā side, you good Scottish lad you, or your Māori side, uh, with that, that deep uh, whakapapa uh, to Pukitapu and uh, Te Atiawa. So, um, you know, it's coming back conscious too of the, of the role that uh, the Scots uh, foot soldiers played in Taranaki. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's those kind of linkages, as Stephen said. There's another lovely uh, link, and this is where I want to, uh, to finish this. Today is uh, clear of Assisi's day uh, across the world, the day where we remember uh, Claire, and we, of course, always uh, remember with Claire uh, Francis of Assisi, uh, the rich man uh, who became a poor man that he might more fully, more profoundly, more deeply uh, live out the way of Jesus. Uh, and the way it uh, renewed the church. And she carried on that charism for many years after Francis's death, uh, founding the order that's known as the Poor Clares. Uh, and uh, here we are as we finish our series of four uh, and with all of the richness of what you've offered us, Jay, uh, we do so um, just recalling uh, back in uh, 1194, the birth of Claire of Assisi. She was born into a patrician family uh, in Assisi in 1194. At the age of 18, she ran away from home to join Francis and his poor brothers. Under his guidance, she became the founder and the first abbess of the order now called the Poor Clares. She directed and led the order with loving discretion and devotion for nearly 40 years. Strongly ascetic, though the rule of the order was, Clare still warned about extremes. She said, our bodies are not made of brass. She died in 1253. And from Isaiah 29, verse 19, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. 
and the neediest of the people shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. The prayer for her day. Jesus, you called the gentle lady Claire to be poor, and by her prayer, her kindness, her courage and self-denial, to reflect your glory. Help us to see the value of poverty and of prayer. So as we come to the close of this night, as we prepare for rest, we recall the song of Simeon. Praise be to God, I have lived to see this day. God's promise is fulfilled and my duty is done. At last you have given me peace, for I have seen with my own eyes the salvation that you have prepared for all nations, a light to the world in its darkness, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to God, sustaining, redeeming, sanctifying, as in the beginning, so now and forever. And if you do happen to have night prayer close at hand, uh, the prayer which uh, almost accidentally ended up in our prayer book, a prayer written at the close of a work, long working day of the prayer book commission. And the writer screwed it up and threw it in the rubbish bin. Fortunately, someone retrieved it, unraveled the piece of paper, and it's become one of the great gifts of night prayer in our prayer book. So we pray together, Lord, it is night. The night is for stillness. Let us be still in the presence of God. It's night after a long day. What has been done has been done. What has not been done has not been done. Let it be. The night is dark. Let our fears of the darkness of the world and of our own lives rest in you. The night is quiet. Let the quietness of your peace enfold us, all dear to us and all who have no peace. The night heralds the dawn. Let us look expectantly to a new day, new joys, new possibilities. In your name we pray. Amen. To God, the Creator who loved us first and gave this world to be our home. To God, the Redeemer who loves us and by dying and rising pioneered the way of freedom. To God, the Sanctifier who spreads the divine love in our hearts. Be praise and glory for time and for eternity. The Divine Spirit dwells in us. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much uh, for joining us over the last four weeks. Thank you uh, to Chris Clark, to Wendy Scott, and to Jay Rooker. Thank you for uh, giving of yourselves into each of these sessions for the way in which we have been inspired and challenged. Uh, and thank you to each and every one of you for joining in your groups or alone as we continue this journey together. God bless you, and may you rest well this night. Good night. Thank you.